Hello, I'm Mike Salem. My dad, Pastor Salem, loved to spread the good news of Jesus to provide hope and encouragement to people all over the world through his biblical teachings and sermons. You will experience that truth from God's Word in today's message. Now let's join Pastor Salem. I'm Pastor Salem, and I want to welcome you to the Christian Worship Hour. Hope you'll, just hope you'll stay with us. We're going to have a wonderful time today. And on the Christian Worship Hour, we have three things in mind. Glorify God, save the sinner, comfort the Christians. That's, that's the whole story right there. And we use the Word of God all the time, the Holy Word of God. Today, we're going to have a sermon on help in the time of trouble. Because we're starting our new year, we're on our second Sunday now, and just uh, looking down the road, and Jesus says in this life you're going to have trials and troubles, and so we just love the Lord, and so we're just going to look at some help. Jesus says, I'll give you help in time of trouble. And then, you know, we get letters. People write letters, and we're just so happy for them, and, uh, and so I want to read some of the letters. And uh, the first one is a very interesting letter. San Francisco, California. And this dear brother writes, this is my first time writing to you and it's on my 44th birthday. I just want to tell you, you are very much appreciated. I am a Vietnamese man and one of the things I love about you is that you pray for other countries. I'm trying to help the Christian worship bar a little bit. Sorry it is not more. Thank you and God bless you. And I thought when I wrote, here's this, here's this dear brother in California, and he's 44, and I'm 94. I'm 50 years older than he is. That, I can't believe I'm that old. That's a half a, half a century. Lord have mercy. And so we're just glad that this dear brother can be with us. Now here's one in uh, Port Orchard, uh, Washington. Uh, you just make my day. I wish you were on every day. When I watch, I just give me the willing to get out my Bible and keep studying. And now I read more now than I have my whole life. Thank the Lord for getting me on the right track. And so here's what we do. We send out a little paper called the New Song. And I'll give the address in just a minute. But it, it has a Bible study. And this, this time, it's uh, this month, month of January, it is the promises of God, some of the promises of God. And then we have the excerpts from letters, and it's just a really a wonderful thing. So I'll mention that in just a minute. Here's Oskaloosa, Iowa. How do I get this fear and doubt out of me that I will spend eternity in hell? Help me, please. Well, we can help her. You bet you we can help her. You know what we do? We give her the word of God. And, when, and just if you have a pencil, write this down. John chapter 5, verse 24. And this is what Jesus said. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Hath right now, the minute you pray, you have everlasting life. And then Jesus says, and shall not come into condemnation. That is, you won't go into hell. You're passed from death unto life. John 5, 24. And the I, reason I love that is because I doubted my salvation when I was a teen, teenager. And, that, and a farmer friend told, gave me that verse, and that's my favorite verse of the Bible. Oh, God. Trust Jesus. Now, we've sent literature to this dear lady in Iowa, and we would write to everyone that accepts the Lord. We send you literature and encourage you, and we pray for you. Here's a letter from Osogel in Washington. Please send a booklet to me of the eight verses that justify suicide. Well, now, uh, I remember now, we have a little booklet. Can a Christian who commits suicide go to heaven? And the answer is, yes, indeed. You bet they can. And then we have eight scriptures from the Bible to prove it. But we don't justify suicide we're just telling you that because a suicide is a sin, there's no question, it's self-murder. But that doesn't put you into hell because Jesus' blood covers all of our sins, past, present, and future. And so if you want the booklet, it's about it's 10 pages. You can write to us. I'll give the address. Get your pencil ready there, and I'll give it to you. I'll give you one more letter, 
and then I'll give you the, uh, what verses it, uh, where to write. And uh, you'll find comfort and help. A Christian can never lose his salvation. I'm going to tell you that right, right out. That's where we stand. And then one more, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Well, I made an error in deductions in my checkbook. That left me able to give you some help. I do so appreciate the items you send me every month about the Christian worship hour. You are so generous. I am old, 99 this past October. It must be because of my Norwegian background. Ha ha, thank you. 99, I'm jealous of her. I'm only 94. And uh, so, uh, boy, I'm shooting for 99, but God only knows. He, you know, the Lord has our times in his hand. And here she is. She's a Nor Norwegian. And we've got our little Norwegian, uh, uh, one of our secretaries is Norwegian. And boy, won't she just grab that. I showed that to her, and she pinned it up on the wall, and I think she's going to have it framed. And the 99 years old, and she's supporting the work. So we get so many good letters, and we just thank you for them. And I hope that you'll write to us. If you'd like to write to us, I'll give you your, our address. Christian Worship Hour, the, the Christian Worship Hour. And the box is 2002-2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. And if you'd like to write to us, or if you have a question or a spiritual question, or if you want to send a gift, we hope that you'll help us that way because we need your help, we're dependent on God's people, you write to us at that address. And for those on shortwave radio, I'm going to give it one more time. It's box, Christian Worship Hour, box 2002, Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. So God bless you all. So now let's look at our sermon for the day. And the first thing, I know some of you get your Bibles and you sit there and you have your Bible ready. You turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 16, chapter 16. And uh, because the whole sermon is going to come out of that 16th chapter of St. John, and I want to give verses. And then when I give the verse, you can look it up and see if I've got it right or if I'm pulling something over on you. See, and you, these preachers, you need to check on them. And I'm so serious about that. When the pastor says something that doesn't sound right, get your Bible. You know, don't go fussing and talking about him behind his back or her back. Get your Bible. See what God says. See, search the scriptures. And so that's what you can do. Get your Bible and have it handy. All right. So now in this passage, in this chapter, God is telling us, Jesus is telling us that help that he gives us to him as we travel this wilderness journey. The whole 16th chapter gives on help that he gives us. And he talks in the 15th chapter, for instance, and he says, now the world is going to be the enemy of Christ. The world will persecute the Christian. And, but he says, I have overcome the world. But in this world, you're going to have troubles and trials. Now then, he, from the 15th chapter, he comes to the 16th chapter. And he continues his discourse. And he goes on to tell of the enmity of the world. Then he deals with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He that Jesus... Uh, how that Jesus uh, we're going to leave them and he's going to send the Holy Spirit and they're going to hold the Holy Spirit's going to help us in this world and help us until we meet the Lord face to face. So we're going to look here, first of all, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit in the world and the Holy Spirit in the Christian. Now, he, God tells us, Jesus tells us in the 15th chapter, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Now he comes to the 16th chapter and the second verse, chapter 16, verse 2. Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Now, that's terrible. And why would the world do that? Why would the world hate the Christian? The Christian is no menace to, menace to the world. The Christian shows love and kindness and forgiveness when the world doesn't. The why would the world hate the Christian? So Jesus tells us why. He says in the third verse, These things have I written unto you because they have not 
known the Father nor me. They don't know God. They don't know Jesus. And that's why they hate the Christian. That's all there is to it. It isn't that we rob banks and stuff like that. We pray for our enemies, poor things. If they get hurt, we fix them up and help them up. And so it's because they don't know God and they don't want to know God. We live in a world today that hates God and wants to stamp God out of all of the picture, everything. The Ten Commandments out of the school are one of the worst mistakes they could ever made. Young people come out now, they don't know what's right and what's wrong. That's God's good word. And so when we preach that, then they hate us and they don't like it. And we read it, our dear brothers and sisters in foreign countries, and they're being put to death and they're dying. And because uh, they're following Jesus, they haven't done any crimes or anything. But they, you see, we're a reproach to the world. And that's why they hate us. And they don't know the Father in heaven. And so when we go against their craw a little bit, then they're all worked up. And so Jesus said, uh, I'm telling you these so that you get prepared. Verse 4, he tells his people, he says, But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. Jesus foreknew what was going to happen. And so he's going to tell, he's telling them, now here, if you want to be my follower, the world is going to hate you. Jesus never hid that. You know, we have cults. They tell you the nice things. And when you get in, then they sell you some wild, crazy stuff that takes away your liberty and everything else. You can't trust them. Jesus told them right out in front, there's going to be a cross. There's going to be suffering. The world is going to hate you. He, Jesus is saying, being a Christian isn't a Sunday school picnic. Picnic. It isn't a dress parade. It's a heavy battle. And a lot of you don't get in it because you're not man enough. That's why you don't. You can't take the heat. So you get out of the kitchen. So Jesus says, the world is going to hate you. The world is going to pay, persecute you. Think of that before you follow me. You're going to have to pay a price. Oh, isn't Jesus, isn't that beautiful? And so we read about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a young Lutheran pastor in Hitler's Nazi Germany declares, declared, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And die he did. John Doberstein writes of Bonhoeffer's death, and he writes it this way. In the gray dawn of an April day in 1945, in a concentration camp at Flossenburg, shortly before it was liberated by the Allied forces, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed by special order of Heinrich Himmler. For innumerable Christians in Germany, on the continent, in England, and in America, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's death has been a contem contemporary confirmation of Tertullian's dictum, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And Jesus said, if you're going to be my follower, and you take up your cross, it's a cross that you have to carry. And he says, it's going to cost you, may cost you your life. And so the Lord Jesus calls us. And so then he tells about the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. And he says the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world. He says, in, he talks about it, of sin and of righteousness and judgment because uh, the way of the world is anti-Christ and anti-God. And so the wonderful Holy Spirit convicts people of sin. And when you convict them of sin and you tell them this is wrong, lo and behold, they will hate you. And so the Holy Spirit is convicting people today. And even right now while I'm preaching, God is talking to you. And he's saying, you know, you ought to make it right with God. You ought to, be, you ought to make peace with God. You ought to come to Jesus Christ. And this conviction will come upon people. And he'll tell you that if, that if you stay in this, this, the present world, if you stay in Satan's kingdom of darkness, where you're anti-Christian and anti-God, then you're going to be in a taste of terrible torment forever and ever because that's where the devil's going to be and that's where all of his followers are going to be. And so it's the Holy Spirit's work in this world to convict people of, of sin and turn them to Jesus. And when I was 10 years old, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, said, you're a sinner. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart, take away my sin. And I know, I know as sure as the sun comes up in the east, that the Holy Spirit is talking to some of you right this minute. 
and he's telling you, you need to come to Jesus. You need to open your heart to Jesus Christ. Maybe this is the first time he's ever come. Maybe it's been several times. Well, I'm going to tell you, he won't come forever. There'll be a last time one of these days. And there'll be no more, there'll be no more love of God. God loves the world. God loves you. He wants you to come. But the moment we die and pass over, if we don't have Jesus Christ, the love of God ends and the judgment of God begins. God Almighty, if people could just listen to that, where are you headed? And to the Lord, right now, the Spirit of God, he's talking to you and he says, you need to come to Jesus. You say, I don't know how. I'll tell you how you do it. You just say in your own words, don't get fancy. Just take, say in your own, the, the thee and the thou and whatever. Just talk to him, say, dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Now I ask you to come into my heart and take away my sins. And I'll follow you the best I can. And I'll forsake all of these evil ways in my life. And I'll walk with you and make you my Lord. Just tell him that in your own words. And then you thank him because when you ask him into your heart, he comes into your heart. You're born again. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You belong to God. Oh, I can imagine that all over the world, there are people praying that right now. Dear Jesus, have mercy on my soul. Save me for Jesus' sake. And oh, Jesus, I love you and I'll serve you. And just in your own words, I had a man the other day, now, some time ago now, and he prayed, he didn't ever know, didn't know about amen. And he prayed to ask Jesus into his heart. And then he said, goodbye. That's fine. That's fine. Just so you pray it and pray it from your heart. That is not something you think in your head, but from your heart, you love Jesus. You want Jesus. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit with the world. Then the world Holy Spirit starts to working with the people, with the Christians. And you know, the Holy Spirit holds back sin and he preaches sin and, and righteousness and judgment and all that, but then he comforts them. And in verse 7, in this gospel, John chapter 16, verse 7, he says, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. What is expedient? Why is it the best thing? Well, it's the best thing simply because the Holy Spirit, if Jesus is here in the flesh, how many people can see him? Can the world see him, touch him, talk to him? No, but the Holy Spirit, oh, Jesus ascends into heaven and the Holy Spirit comes and he dwells in the hearts of every believer. And if you just pray now to accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit's in your life and he'll help you. And this is what he'll do. The first thing he'll do, he'll, he'll instruct you on how to live. Verse 12, this is what Jesus said. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You see, he's so considerate of his followers. He's told them, you're going to have to be a cross. My, the symbol of my church is not a lazy boy rocker, but it's a cross, a cross, death, suffering. And he's told them that. Now he says, you won't understand the whole thing right now, but I'll show you as you go along. It's like a student going and he's taking algebra and he starts with algebra and he has to get the fundamentals and then he has to a little more and a little more and a little more and then he gets in geometry and trigonometry. I never took any of that stuff. I'd have flunked sure as a world, so I took something else like literature, read stories. But anyway, the Holy Spirit, that's what God's doing. And he says, I've got a lot of things to share. You're not ready for them yet. But as they come, I'll share them. And say, I'll show you my will. I'll show you my way. And so a guide, I'll be your guide. And, that, and so we're, we're pilgrims in this world. This world isn't our home. And we're on our moving, going to our home now. And people need a guide. They need somebody to lead them. Everyone needs them. My goodness sakes, the young people need them. The old people need them. We all need a guide to help us. And then the Holy Spirit gives us encouragement. And he says very plainly that he's going to leave them. Jesus says, I'm going to leave you. And, and then he says in verse 16, a little while and you shall not see me. And again, a little while and you shall see me because I go to my father. And then he says in verse 20, verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. 
And so Jesus is telling them, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die on the cross. In a little while, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die and the world is going to rejoice. You're going to be lamenting and you're going to weeping. You're going to be crying, but the world is going to be rejoicing and we got him at last. But then Jesus said, he tells us in a little while, then he says, there's going to be rejoicing. What does he say here? But the world shall rejoice. Well, now a Christian is going to be rejoicing because in verse 20, he says, ye shall be sorrowful, but, but your sorrow shall, sorrow shall be turned into joy. Your sorrow will be turned, your sorrowing, it'll be turned into joy. Then he gave an illustration in verse 21. He says, a woman, when she's in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is, not, is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born into the world. There you have it. Here is this woman. She is having in childbirth. She is a terrible pain and sorrow and anguish and wow. And then all of a sudden here this little son is born and she holds this little mutt in her hand and says, look at there, you about killed me a minute ago. Now I'm rejoicing. I am so happy. I have a son. I brought a son into the world. See, that's what Jesus is saying. They're going to put me on the cross. And they're going to rejoice. The world is going to rejoice. And you're going to cry and weep. But then I'm going to come down from that cross. And I'm going to be in that grave three days and three nights. And then I'm going to come from the grave. And I'm going to live forever. And I and will be in your heart forever by the Holy Spirit. And your, all of your sorrow of the cross will rejoice in the joy of the resurrection. Only God can bring joy out of sorrow. You know what the devil does? All he does is torment people. And yet you follow him. You go out, drag along with him to all of his dirty joints and her dirty tricks and terrible life and pornography. And I don't know what all. I shouldn't name anything because there's so much of it. I'll leave something out and you'll think it's okay. You know the wickedness in the world. All the devil can do is just give you sorrow and grief and so you can smoke until you die with lung cancer. That's what that devil does. He never did a good thing in his life. And, but Jesus can take hard things and bring joy out of them. That's why I love him so much. I just do love Jesus. And if you don't love Jesus, you know why you don't love him? Because you don't know him. You don't know him. And if you just make that prayer, he'll come into your heart. Now, maybe you'll feel joy and maybe you'll feel ecstasy and maybe you won't feel anything. It's a transaction is what it is. The emotions have nothing to do with it. It's a transaction whereby you say, oh, Jesus, I give you my sins and I take your righteousness. See, that's what it is. And it happens the moment you pray. It's not when you die that you find out whether you're going to heaven. My dear old grandmother, oh God, I love her. I'm going to see her. And I say, oh grandma, I'll see you in heaven. We'll see each other in heaven. And she would always say, I hope so. Now she trusted Jesus, but she had no assurance. And all of her life she hoped and she hoped. Now you get that out of your head. Because John 5, 24, and there's many others, John 3, 16, John 1, 12, John 3, 36. Oh, I could give them to you. If I could remember, I could give them to you all for the rest of the service and then some. And so he gives you eternal salvation and you will never perish. And when you come to heaven's gates, you know God isn't going to allow any sin in heaven. Not one speck. And we've got so much sin, we get so used to it, and we get acclimated to it that it doesn't bother us much, or it doesn't as much, much as it should. But Jesus Christ is holy and sinless. That's why he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane, because he took on himself the sins of the world, and he agonized so much he sweat blood. That's how much he hates sin. There'll be no sin in heaven. So when I get to heaven's gate, and I say, oh, I did all that preaching. He said, you didn't do a very good job, did you? And I said, no. Well, oh, I guess I didn't come to think of it. No, he won't ask me anything. He'll look at me and I'll be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They won't see me. My sins are all washed away. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And he sees Christ because he sees a righteousness. That's what he does. And when you accept Jesus Christ, you'll be clothed in that righteousness and you'll be his forever. Now, if you made that prayer, you write to us and we'll send you some literature and we'll pray for you. Maybe you have some other, maybe you've drifted away from the Lord and you want to come back, you come back. And then you write to us, and we write to us at the Christian Worship Hour. The box is 2002-2002. We're in Aberdeen, South Dakota, 57402. And we just pray that you'll, uh, that you'll help us out. Maybe you can help us, you know. God, uh, we're, de we're dependent upon God's people to support us. We're not underwritten by any organization, corporation, or church. So you have to help us. So ask the Lord what to do. And then you ask if you have accepted the Lord, if you want to have some literature, and we'll be praying. As a matter of fact, I'm going to pray for you now. And if you want that new song, by the way, and if you want that article on suicide, you just let us know. We'll send it free and postpaid. We, we, uh, we, if you can help us with a little on something, uh, paying, but you write, and we'll help. We'll, we'll get back to you. So, Heavenly Father, just thank you for this wonderful Savior now, all over the world, and we pray, Lord, especially for the people in Israel today, those who are maybe having a hard time of it, and they need your help. They're not being beheaded, but many times they have opposition by Satan. Help them. And then, dear Lord, those who are on beds of sickness and those who are shut-ins and can't get out, and winter's getting long now, Lord, and they can't get out at all. So just help them to know that you said you'd never leave them or forsake them. You are by their side. You're helping them, and you'll give them strength and courage, and you love them. and help them just to talk to you and to witness to you and tell others about the wonderful, wonderful Jesus, that Jesus who went to the old rugged cross and shed his blood, the, the good shepherd dying for the flock, and help them all, help us all to be grateful and thankful in Jesus' holy name. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you for opening your homes for us, wherever you live. And I hope that you'll pray for us, and I hope that you'll write to us. And maybe you can tell somebody else about our program, and they'll tune us in. We'll all worship the Lord together. This is an international telecast, so it goes all over the world. And as we trust Jesus, we can love him and serve him. And when you write to us, remember that we'll use it very carefully. Remember the ECFA? Every penny spent wisely and carefully. So God bless you. God be with you. And the Lord loves you, and we love you too. That's the mission of the Christian Worship Hour. In Jesus' name, amen. My dad loved to preach because he got to tell people of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. If you would like to learn more about having a relationship with Jesus and grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Click the encouragement link on our website at cwh.org. You may also stream more programs, subscribe to our monthly newsletter, and view Pastor Salem's devotions and answers. We would be most grateful if you would pray for this ministry and help us financially to continue proclaiming the gospel. God bless you.